to introduce yourself. So you can just present a slide that says uh, basically what you're doing so the other people know. It's only maximum three slides, but one, enough, one should be enough. And also maximum three minutes, just one minute or two minutes, just to introduce yourself and tell everybody where you are from, what do you study, and what are you working on. Um, and in the afternoon, we will have some hands-on sessions. The idea of this uh, school is that it's very practical, so we, all, we will all put exercises. Obviously, you don't have to do them all. You just choose whatever is more interesting or you think it can be done. Um, I want to call your attention to this colloquium. Originally, I was plan B, but we are lucky to have Marcelo with us, so uh, Marcelo will give the colloquium on the destructive effect of human stupidity. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> and it's, uh, I don't know about the Cipolla's fundamental laws, but I, I'm looking forward to the colloquium. And then at the end of the week, we're going to have a presentation of the projects. The idea is that pretty much the same thing as the beginning, but now you will tell us what did you do, if you found uh, of all these exercises, if you selected to work on one or two, if you can put your results, if you didn't, uh, if you don't want to present the project, well, whoever wants to do this, uh, there is some time to discuss the the results of the of the work of the whole week. Okay, so I will start with my presentation today on time series analysis, and my first um, session is basically something to start up to warm up. So because I don't know what do you know, what you don't know. There's people from different backgrounds here, so maybe some of you are very familiar with all this and some of you are not. So we're going to start from a very fast introduction from the start of dynamical systems to present day of complex systems. But before that, I want to present myself. I am originally from Montevideo, Uruguay. I did my master and bachelor degrees in the Facultad de Ciencias in Uruguay. And I had a PhD from the United States. And I've been professor of physics in the Politecnica de Catalunya for many years now. This is a, just a picture of our, of our group. This is where we are. We are in Catalunya, it's part of Spain. <laughs> and my university has seven campuses. I am in Terrassa, which is about half an hour from 45 minutes from Barcelona. This is the lab, the picture of the lab. I will give you some examples on lasers. I know this is a school on economical complexity. But there are a lot of things that you can learn from uh, data recorder, recording from laser, laser systems. So basically, what we do in our group is a mix of three different things. We focus on the basic understanding of nonlinear physics, nonlinear complex systems. We try to develop new analysis techniques specific for some problems of nonlinear systems. And then we try to apply this. And basically, lasers are very similar to neurons. So we have research lines on laser dynamics and neuronal dynamics. Under some circumstances, a laser can be very similar to a neuronal dynamics. And then we try to understand the behavior of complex systems in a network. Stream events, what you see here, a plot. This is a stream wave, or typical things of complex systems. And then applications to biomedical signals. This is the image of an eye. That you can extract a complex network from the retina. And this is uh, studies that we have done on climate data. And we have also done some research on uh, brain signals. Um, and I will put a little bit of examples on, 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 on this of what we have done. So basically, as I said, this seems like a very broad, different things that we are working on. And that's true, but there are connections, and that's the interesting thing about uh, complex systems. It's very, it's very interesting to find some really interesting connections on systems that are very different. This is a, the output of a laser, the intensity in, uh, recorded with an oscilloscope, and this is a simulation of a ne neuron. You can see the spikes. And this is how uh, a laser turns on. <coughs> a laser is a, is a threshold system. Below threshold is off, and you can see all these spikes. And this is um, an example of what is called a tipping point. There's a lot of research nowadays to develop techniques to detect approaching bifurcations, approaching tipping points, and we need data. And sometimes experiments are not very easy to do. 
So that's something we can do with lasers. This is another example of a tipping point recorded with, with a laser. In this case, the laser abruptly changes the polarization. And if you're looking through a polar, you put a polarizer in the middle, it's like it abruptly turns off. So this is a, a research line that we're working on, trying to see if we can develop methods to try to forecast, to predict that such transition, either gradual or abrupt, will take on. So we're also working on extreme events. And this is an example of a, of a, optic, of a road wave, which is basically a freak wave. And this is was, it's a famous example because it was recorded, well, many years ago. And this is the surface of the sea. And you can see between 20 and minus 10, there's a really out of the blue, a huge wave that looks like a, a wall, a vertical wall of water. And of course, this is very difficult to study because there's no data. You don't know when this is going to happen and so on. So lasers, again, come to the rescue or allowed to generate data because they have underlying similarities in the governing equations. Hydrodynamics and optics, they have some similarities. And under some conditions, you can also have these extreme events. And we can try to develop techniques to try to predict, to forecast, to understand what type of conditions uh, lead to this type of behavior. So basically, that's what time series analysis is. We try, we analyze all these different type of data, and we try to extract some information. And basically, what I will try to give you in this first uh, presentation is a start. What, how this, uh, all this system started, the, 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 the origin of the theory of dynamical systems, and then going through some examples up to present situation in which people are worried about the behavior of networks in many different contexts. So dynamical systems, a dynamical system is a system that changes in time. It can be a pendulum, a sicarian a cell, whatever. And basically the origin was the, <laughs> the start of this is in the time of Newtonian dynamics. And you have this concept of ordinary differential equations that allow you to trace from some initial conditions the trajectory, the trajectory in some phase space. And Newton studied the two, what, what is known as the two-body problem, no? the, the moon around the sun and, or the, the, the earth. And you can calculate the trajectories and can be done analytically. But then, of course, when you add more complexity, this is not possible to solve analytically. So the next uh, big advancement, very fast, is Poincaré. And he developed a theory of a geometrical. So the idea was. Instead of saying, I'm going to try to calculate the trajectories, which was already not possible, uh, let's see if we ask questions about the long-term behavior of the system. So for instance, if it's going to be stable or there will be some planet that will be uh, like a comet, run away and never come back. So he basically, he was the first one to talk about the concept of the phase space. The phase space is the number of variables that a system has. And as I will talk later, this really can, you can classify systems as dynamical systems described by a few variables or complex systems that has a high dimensional phase space. So he searched for the structures in this phase space that divide the region in different uh, regions with different types of qualitative behavior. Of course, you can find these structures if the phase space is low dimensional. But it'd be very difficult to find a point session that divides the space in two regions is the phase space is high dimension. So he found this uh, theorem that is quite famous in dynamical systems that says that certain systems will, after some time, come back to the state or to very close. So that, that means the system will not run away. And, and that can be uh, done analytically, but we cannot calculate the trajectories. And he had a, the first uh, intuition of the possibility of chaos saying that the evolution of a deterministic system can be a periodic, unpredictable, and strongly depends on the initial conditions. And that is basically the, the idea that we all have now of a chaotic system. There is a prediction horizon, and after that, we don't know what is going to happen. The initial conditions in a deterministic system fully determine the future state, and that is the, the definition of a chaotic system. There is no randomness, but on the long term, 
the, the, the state is determined, but we don't know. It's unpredictable. And that's one of the uh, problems in, in, in time series analysis that we want to do is what is the prediction horizon and how to estimate the uncertainty. So the next advance in dynamical systems was when the first computer started in the 50s. <coughs> and the next progress was um, Lorentz. This is a famous, famous attractor, the chaotic attractor uh, that represents the dynam atmospheric dynamics very simplified. And um, this is the first uh, chaotic system in which people de dedicated a lot of uh, work trying to study this dynamical system that display deterministic chaos. So in a, in a system like this, the present fully determines the future, but if I only know approximately the present, then I have no idea what's going to happen in the future. It does not apply. So which systems can be chaotic? Basically, if we have a continuous time system, a system that is continuous in time, described by, for instance, uh, Maxwell, um, Newton's equation, ordinary differential equations, you need at least three variables, because if you have only two, there are either stable behavior or periodic oscillations, okay? Uh, and again, how one, one of the things that we'll be discussing in the next uh, classes is how to quantify chaos, we, maybe you heard about this, with um, the Abuna exponents, and how can we distinguish whether the system is chaotic or it's just noise. And, of course, people said, oh, there are these chaotic systems, fantastic, but the, the, is this just on models or can we really observe this in some experiments? Experiments with chaotic systems are not so, uh, were not so popular at that time, but with lasers, again, <laughs> you can uh, put the laser in, in some experimental conditions in which really it, it, it does uh, have some uh, chaotic behavior. So this is one of the first examples of a, a chaotic uh, system that was recorded experimentally. Now in the 70s, big surprise came because we always thought, oh, we need at least three equations, but it turns out that very simple models, very, very simple models can also display chaotic behavior, okay? So that was the logistic map. I want to ask a question, who is familiar with the logistic map? Most of you have heard of the logistic map. Most of you, but not everybody, maybe. I don't know. Uh, anyway, so this is a, a very simple equation. It's a map. You give the value of x, apply this equation, and obtain the next value. And it turns out that they can be, they can show stable behavior, but it can also be periodic and apparently completely random, in spite of the fact that the equation is perfectly deterministic. So let me just give you an example. We have a parameter r that we can choose a small, an initial condition, and you see that after a transient, you apply this equation in an iterative way, and eventually get to a fixed point, okay? You can calculate this analytically. After a transient relaxation, you have long-term stability. But then if you change your control parameter, and you increase it, you have this period doubling, okay? This is a famous uh, root to chaos. Period doubling, you have oscillations period two, and then oscillations period four, and then you get to totally uh, irregular behavior. So after a transient, you have oscillations that can be regular or irregular. And to show this in a global picture, not like I'm showing you now with different examples, you do what is called a bifurcation diagram. And this is one of the most famous bifurcation diagrams. What you do, and this is very important, you neglect the transient time. And then after a while, you start saving all your points and plot them in the vertical axis versus the control parameter. And this is the type of bifurcation uh, um, diagram that you will obtain. So this is when it's a stable point, then you have a period doubling, then you have a, a period four, and so on. Okay, so this was well understood until there was some surprise, which is there's some order here. There's some order, and this was discovered by Feigenbaum, that discovered this Feigenbaum scaling parameter, which basically means that the, <coughs> the bifurcation points here, the distances, scale in a very precise way. 
okay? So those differences, uh, if you do the limit, um, considering increasingly smaller uh, intervals between period two, period four, period three, and so on, it gives a number <coughs> that is, turns out to be uh, quite generic. It turns out that a lot of functions, not just a logistic map, have exactly the same number. And this, I always tell this to my students, was done with this calculator. Now, <laughs> this was the first example, the first calculator that was programmable. Of course, you haven't seen it. I saw it from far away. I never used it. I don't remember using it. But I do remember having something similar at home with some magnetic cards. So using this uh, calculator, Feigenbaum discovered this uh, order within chaos, which it turns out to be a um, universal law. Because uh, any function that is quadratic will have the same scaling. And that means that many different systems that can be described phenomenologically by some form of map like this go to chaos in the same way, quantitatively, with the same coefficient. Now, can we do, can we observe this experimentally? Or oh, this is just something that not very nice in the models, but real life and noise and so on will not allow. Again, lasers <laughs> allow to, um, to see these uh, bifurcations. So this is a laser that it has the energy or the losses, I, I don't remember, but whatever is modulated, and you can increase the amplitude of this modulation in the parameter. And then you see this type of uh, period doubling and period four. Of course, the root doesn't look so nice and the, as in the Feigenbaum uh, example, but it's a real, it was the first example as far as I know that they discover this um, period doubling root to chaos. So again, uh, I, I talk about this because one of the problems of time series analysis is how to identify that we are approaching one of these transitions here. For example, these abrupt transitions, okay? And well, there are techniques that we'll talk about this later, but essentially when we are in real life and we're changing a parameter in time, we might be always living in a transient. So how can we really know whether our behavior, the behavior we're observing is stationary or is just a long, very long transient? Okay, so in the 70s with the computers, many other possibilities appear. And of course, we can discover things that were not possible with the simple uh, computing before, available before. So one of the most important concepts was this concept of fractal objects in which I know, a, a part of the object is identical to the whole. And if you start looking in and in, you always see the same. And this was basically uh, discovered by Mandelbrot that was working on IBM, and he had access to the state of the art of computing available at that time, so he did very nice plots, and you, many of you may be familiar with all this. So how do you estimate the dimension of a fractal? And we will go there to this in the next class. Think about this as an object, as an object, and then you can use this simple box counting method. You count, you put boxes, no? And you consider how many boxes you need to cover depending on the size. And uh, the number of boxes scales like this with this, the effective dimension. Of course, this is an object, and this is what I'm gonna teach is a time series analysis. So you actually have a time series. So how can you do this? We will try to explain how to reconstruct an attractor from a time series, and then use this type of technique to detect or quantify the dimension. And it's important because as we were saying, the phase space of a complex system can be very large, but if you estimate the dimension, then you know or estimate the defective numbers of dimensions. You can use, maybe uh, the, the, the system can be high dimensional, but they might be represented by a few uh, dimensions, effective dimensions. So these are examples of fractal objects, the Cantor set, in which you eliminate one third, and in each segment you repeat the process, eliminate one third, and you end up with an object that is a set of points, so it has but they are in a line, so the dimension is between zero and one. And if you do the same for a triangle, 
basically eliminate the center and so on, you end up with a fractal object again in which the dimension is between one and two, okay? And of course, this has been studied in, in real life and it has many bio biomedical applications. I'm here putting uh, lungs, but we have actually used this technique to characterize the eyes because you can extract a, reti uh, a network and calculate the dimension of that network, that fractal dimension of the network. It is related with the conditions of the, well, of the eye condition. And then finances. <laughs> of course, in finances, it's very important because this is a, a school on economic, socioeconomic complexity. So the fractal concept is not an abstraction, but it's a mathematical formulation of a well-known fact. Movements of a stock or currency all look alike when the market chart is enlarged or reduced. So basically an observer cannot tell which of the data concerns prices that change from week to week or day to day or hour to hour. And that is a, more, a very, very important characteristic in, in financial data. And if you are interested, I think I can recommend this article. It's quite old, but it's in Scientific American Open Access and, and it gives you a real uh, insight onto fr fractal behavior in financial markets. Okay, so then the next development was saying, okay, thermodynamics tell us that disorder increases, entropy tends to increase, but we see every day in life that there is some patterns, that there are some organization. We already know with Feigenbaum that there might be chaos, but there is order in chaos, and now we wonder how these patterns emerge. What is the law? And this was uh, studied by Prigozhin, that got a Nobel Prize. He did experiments in chemistry and studied chemi chemical systems far from equilibrium. And he discovered that the interplay of external input of energy and dissipation can lead to, the, to, to, to these uh, spatiotemporal patterns that, uh, that are the result of systems that are far from the equilibrium. Obviously, equilibrium is disorder but there is this input of energy and output via dissipation. So there are many examples of these patterns. I didn't, I didn't really find any in, in socioeconomic systems, so I, I, I am not gonna go into this, but if you look in meteorological and biomedical data and, and ecological data, well, there's plenty of that. So then the attention moved to uh, basically synchronization. No, we know that we have chaotic systems, can we synchronize them? Because maybe if we can synchronize, we can predict uh, the behavior of one by looking at the other. And the first paper on the synchronization of chaotic systems was in the 90, and they chose uh, two uh, Lorentz systems and replaced one of the variables of the slave by the, the variable of the master. So they observed basically that after a while, the two other variables tend to synchronize. The, 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 and they also, even if the systems were not identical, eventually, if, there are, if the systems are completely identi identical, the error decreases logarithmically. And if they are small differences, they still synchronize, but not completely. In fact, the first observation of synchronization, but not of chaotic systems, of oscillators, was done much earlier because the, the Huygens, and I don't know if you heard about this, pendulum, Huygens pendulum, this is what is called entrainment. Two oscillators, they, they, they entrain the frequencies, they interact through, through some bar in which they hang in, and they tend to oscillate in antiphase. There are also possible conditions for in-phase oscillators, okay? So there was a lot of work on the synchronization, either chaotic or uh, entrainment of regular oscillators. And again, can we observe this experimentally? By now you know that I'm gonna put an example on lasers. Yes, uh, it's an example of lasers. Because lasers is again easy because you can inject the light of one laser into the other laser and make each laser chaotic. So yes, it's possible to, uh, two systems that are not coupled, if you plot one variable versus the other, you will have a cloud of points of some sort. But if you plot them in this way, then if they are synchronized, then you will see that um, they, they, they are highly correlated. 
And that's a very simple way to try to see if two systems have synchronized or some, some sort of synchronized. But then people realize that there are many different types of synchronization. If they are identical, yes, you can have this equation. But if they're not identical, then the phases of the oscillations can be synchronized, but the amplitudes not really. And this is very typical in ecological systems. Populations can grow up and down, but the, the, the amplitudes are not synchronized, it's just the phase. And also there can be some lags in the interaction between the two systems. So one system can be lagging ahead or behind. And more in general, there can be a functional relationship between them. And this function might not be so easy to detect. So that's, that's typical problem on time series analysis. And that is bivariate analysis. If I have two, two time series, can I detect if the, there's underlying coupling or delays? And how can I quantify this? Okay, so an, uh, another issue of time series is noise. And people start looking at what was the effect of noise when the system is nonlinear. And here they are very, very curious. They found that noise, people usually try to get rid of noise and filter out noise and reduce noise as much as possible. But there was this phenomenon of a stochastic resonance. I want to know how many of you are familiar with the stochastic resonance? One of you? Okay, so in nonlinear systems, in some of them, an optimal level of noise can uh, increase the detection of a weak signal. That without noise, we cannot perceive. So this is exactly the opposite of what we feel. That there is, there's not of noise, we don't hear. This is the opposite. If the signal is very weak, noise helps hear this signal. And this is an example of a stable system plus some signal and the noise. And you can see here that if the noise is very small, the V-stable system stays in one or in the other state. If the signal external is large enough, sorry, if the noise is large enough, the noise helps switching from the two states. And if the noise is too large, then it's, it's too many switches. So, you can see here that for an optimal level of noise, you can perceive the presence of a periodic signal. And this periodic signal is so weak that if the, there is no noise, there's no way to see it. And if there is too much noise, you don't see it either. Can we look at this in lasers? Yes, we can. <laughs> and we have some lasers, as I said, that are be stable in terms of poly polarization. They change the polarization from one to another. And here is an example of the output when you uh, look through a polarizer, OK? So you can see here that there is a tiny signal here, all right? And you can see that as you increase the noise, the signal, uh, the system starts switching more until you don't see it. Now, if I show you the signal, which is this one, it's a periodic, in fact, you can see that this level of noise, intermediate level of noise, is the optimum for the system to follow this signal. Uh, a related phenomenon it occurs in what is called excitable systems. Excitable systems are dynamical systems that have, are very peculiar in some sense, but all neurons and, and cardiac cells are excitable, so this is a very interesting dynamical system. It's usually described by few equations, so it's typically not complex, but it can be periodic or it can even be chaotic. But the, the, the interesting thing is that if you do a small perturbation, there is no response. If you do a perturbation above a given threshold, then there is a pulse. If you increase your perturbation, as long as it's along above the threshold, you still get the same pulse. If you do two perturbations well separated in time, you have two pulses. But if you do two perturbations that are too close, you only have one pulse. The second one fails to produce a pulse. Right? And to, so this type of uh, excitable system, when you change your parameter, is an arrest in, in a resting state, and it starts spiking. And it can spike, and the frequency can become higher, or it can be constant. Again, there are different types of neurons, but they all have this characteristic. Uh, when you perturb, the perturbation has to be high enough. And if you perturb too close again, 
the second perturbation doesn't produce an effect. Anyway, so what's the role of noise here? And they again found a, res a resonance effect. There is a level of noise, optimal noise, that gives uh, optimal response. And this is called a phenomenon that is known as coherence resonance instead of stochastic resonance, because here we don't have an external signal. Here it's just the system and how it, repo how it responds to the noise. Basically, this is a famous simple model for, for neurons, the Figur-Nagumno model. It has two equations, so it only has spikes, uh, periodic spikes or stable behavior. But if you add noise, then uh, this is the type of behavior you have, increasing the noise. You see very, very weak noise. The, the spikes are, are irregular. Intermediate level of noise, you almost have a periodic regular spikes. And if it's too much noise, the, there is again irregularity. So the message here is that noise can somehow induce optimal levels of noise, can induce some regular behavior, which is not expected if you think that noise will only increase the randomness on the system. And it has been quantified. I will talk about this uh, quantification next class when we talk about the, the autocorrelation function and, and look at some properties of this type of system. Again, it has been observed in lasers. I don't want to bore you, but there are plenty of examples in which when you put noise to the laser, appropriate level of noise, it gives to regular response. And you can even change a parameter and keep the noise fixed. If your, le if your level of noise is fixed, for instance, in a, in, in, in a system that the, the, it has a given level of noise and that's something you cannot change, you can always change a parameter and you might end up finding that some optimal parameter here might lead, give a, a, regular, um, a regular concept. And what is noise? I mean, basically, uh, that's the question, no? What is noise? For people that, uh, for someone, noise is the important thing, and for others, it's something that filters out, no? If you are interested on the weather, that is noise for people that study the climate, okay? So basically, the, the, one of the problems, again, that we will discuss in the rest of the classes are how to find your signal, what to do with the noise. Is the noise the important thing that you need to consider, filter, try to filter out, or you're filtering out what is actually important information. In terms of social systems, I think, I'm not sure who, but maybe Marcelo will talk about this idea of Asians that behave like Brownian particles. But of course, they have their own uh, internal states, they interact with each other, they can store assets, energy, information. And so it has been, uh, it has been uh, this concept of stochastic resonance has been applied in, in the concept of ancient based models that will be part of the next classes. In particular, in social system, Marcelo, 20 years ago, did a paper on the, the formation of opinions. No? Opinions are affected, if I understand correctly, from social imitation. And then you have this fashion that can be considered a wave, okay? And then there is some uh, in, in randomness in the people, in the, we are all different, and that can be considered like random noise. <coughs> and they show that um, an optimal level of heterogeneity in the people, if I'm correct, uh, can lead to a strong amplification of the system response to the fashion wave, okay? So, an optimal, if we are too diverse, we don't respond to this. Uh, but, and if we are too equal also, but uh, being sufficiently different uh, allows us to amplify this uh, external signal. And it was also interesting to find that this occurs depending on the system size. So you might not be able to change your parameter, you might not change the level of noise, but you can change the size of the system, how many agents you have in your system. And that is called system size stochastic resonance. Particular size or optimal size of the system enhances certain effects. So these are the references. And in the last 
20 years, people start looking at the behavior of not just two, but many large number of oscillators and more, more, more in general complex units. This is an example of a tree in Malaysia that there, is, there are some uh, insects and with enough number of insects, they can synchronize and then the, f the tree flashes. I haven't found any video about this, but that's what I heard that the tree flashes like uh, on off, but there are all these insects that they synchronize the flashing, okay? Another example of synchronization of large number of uh, units is the uh, opening of the London Millennium Bridge. This is quite famous on the, I don't know if any of you is familiar with what happened. The bridge start going like this, but the queen was fine. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is when a lot of people went there. Okay, so this is again the system size resonance, right? If there's too many people, they synchronize with the bridge and they produce an oscillation and they had to uh, close the bridge. And Pablo will talk about this. It's also about the clapping. When people clap, uh, it's enough people, they synchronize. It's very interesting. And here is a reference to, to an, a simple model that explained what was observed in this bridge. So basically, the most uh, known model that explains this type of oscillatory behavior of many particles is what is called a phase or a model. So we consider, forget about the amplitude of the oscillations and just look at the phase of the oscillations. And if it's a periodic oscillation, it can be described by a phase right, this moving in a circle. And if we have a set of units that are mutually independent, they will be uh, uniformly more or less scattered in this circle, okay? They go, no interaction, and this is known as the Kuramoto model. Here we have the original version. Everybody is coupled to everybody else. And um, you have here the coupling and you have here some noise, and here is each individual has its own frequency for rotating, okay? So you can see that this is um, the most simple model to describe how collective behavior emerges, and the question is how to quantify. What happens when you increase this parameter, which is what couples one element to all the others, all right? Uh, yes, this is the order parameter, which basically is just adding all these vectors here. If you add all the vectors, and if they are uniformly distributed, basically you get something very close to zero. But if they are all more or less in phase, then there is a, a well-defined ve vector, and then you can consider the modulo, the, 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 the modulo of this. And that's your order parameter that describes how synchronized is the system. Basically, if they are uh, in an incoherent state, this is close to zero. And if they are more or less all synchronized in phase, they are is close to one. And this is an example of what happens. Here is described also with an amplitude of a set of oscillators. As you increase the um, coupling, you see that they start becoming in phase. And also, they, they organize such that the fastest, go, um, the fastest go ahead and push for the others that lag behind, OK? All right, so I don't want to uh, go into many details on this. But when you look at the evolution of the control parameter versus time, you see that if the coupling is small, it goes to 0 after some transient, while if the Coupling is strong enough, it goes to a old value that can be almost close to one. So there is some, if you plot here versus the coupling, you can see that there is some sort of phase transition. And the, there is a transition from incoherence to coherence. And I don't know if you're going to talk about this video, but there is this clapping example there in, in the video by, it's interesting. You, you yeah. have the slides available. No, no? Oh, okay. Well, if you have some time, this is an interesting video. Anyway, so basically, in the last years, this, uh, this is what, the, the, what we are interested in, in what is called complex systems. 
And I want to clarify that if the system is linear and there are linear interactions, then the system is complicated, but it's not complex, okay? So we don't refer to complex system as a linear system. It's a huge system, linear, but if it's linear, it's linear, and basically you can understand just by using a rep reductionist approach. You can divide the system in certain parts and then integrate. Complex systems have to have a large number of elements or have to be systems described by a large number of variables, a very large phase space, and they have the elements and the interactions of both have nonlinear properties. The main difference, again, in a complex system, this reductionist of trying to understand the individual parts is, doesn't work. And the important thing is this emergent behavior that uh, there is some emergent behavior that appears in a complex system which is not present in the individual elements. And that's the idea of complexity science. You use what is called networks to, to, to represent how the elements are connected. We also call graph. Um, and these are the, it's the, the, describe the structure of, of, the, of the system. And basically, again, the, the important system, the important thing is to try to understand how the structure and the dynamics of each unit and the dynamics of the couplings interact to understand what emerges. So typically, you will have different type of networks, and the course on networks is on Wiki. That will talk about how to characterize these different type of networks. You can be regular, like the two examples on top, can be some random connections, or they can be some hierarchical structure, but it's also uh, kind of irregular, no? And there are many other examples. Eh? These are just very simple cases. And there are many applications of network science or complexity science in epidemics, in rumor spreading, in transport networks, or any type of transport of energy, information, financial, economics, and biomedical applications. I just want to give you an example of, uh, because we are in a school on socioeconomical complexity, so this is a first simple example on the, on the representation as a network of a set of uh, financial institutions. The nodes uh, represent major institutions along the world. The links are um, directed and weighted because they, 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 they are directed from one institution to another, weighted because they, they capture the, the strengths of the interaction. And the colors here in this plot uh, represent uh, the different geographical locations where the, the institutions are based. Okay? You can, there's lots of references and um, work on financial networks. And hopefully by the end of the school, you have a more clear idea. This is um, an example on social systems. And this is a real example of the transmission of COVID. This is, um, we have, um, this is a, a school on, 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 how you say this? Well, it's here. Uh, people that are attending a training course of, with other fitness instructors. And there was guy, one guy that was, had COVID, which is the blue node. And then the fitness instructors spread the, 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 the disease to the students. And then the students went to the family and then the family went to co-workers. So you can see the, how the, the net the, the spread. And in time series analysis, what we want to do, and it's a main problem we will talk about, is how to infer the links if we have the data. How, we, how can we detect whether there's a link between two individuals or two units, etc. So of course you can adapt the Kuramoto model to this type of situation because it's not realistic to think that everybody interacts with everybody. So you put what is called an adjacency matrix that is equal to one if two oscillators are connected and it's equal to zero otherwise. And then you can understand, you can put some properties in these connections. They might be random, but it's possible that the fastest one have many links and the slowest ones have only few links. This is a possibility. Maybe people tend to connect to the faster people and the slowest ones, not really. And if you think about this, when you um, 
calculate the order parameter, how, how it is synchronized, how's the transition to synchronization in this case, you will see that, of course, depends on uh, the matrix, this Asha sensing matrix. If it's random, we still have some, some smooth transition. But if we start putting some structure, like a scale free or even a, a boss and a lot of uh, uh, <coughs> leaves, what is called leaves or ended, dead end nodes, then you can have a really uh, abrupt transition. You can have hysteresis, which means the system can be either synchronized or unsynchronized. And this has been called explosive synchronization. And it has been found in many systems. So you have here some references. Um, I'm not so sure about social systems, but uh, I think, yes. I think it, there are reviews on, on explosive synchronization that put examples uh, from different areas. So basically, nowadays, we have networks of networks, right? We have that this just one network. Yes, it is a good representation, but it doesn't give a lot of, it doesn't take into account that there are different parts of the network that do different, have different roles in the system. For instance, uh, there's a water network, there is a energy part, transportation, and so on. So there are, you can also conceive of this as, as community structure. If all the nodes are of the same type, you could consider that there's one group of nodes that interact a lot with them, and then they're, they're, but there can be either very different. So there's also the possibility of considering that um, different type of nodes uh, can represent different networks that interact. So we we want to understand how some critical transitions, some tipping points, some stream event, how does uh, transmit to other networks. How, how was it, we want to try to forecast what's going to happen if some link fails, for instance. So basically, to summarize, from dynamical systems to complex systems, and now more, more recently in what is known as data science. Dynamical systems allows you to understand bifurcations, low dimensional systems, the concept of a low dimensional attractor, chaos, and so on. It allows to uncover path order <laughs> and universality, okay? But then when you have large systems, then you have this emergence behavior that can be many different types of synchronization. And complexity science basically studies this type of emergent phenomena in large uh, systems that can include tr critical transitions, extreme events, and so on. So basically, time series analysis, what it does is extract features from the time series. Okay, extract, that encapsulates different properties of the time series. So many different methods we're gonna see that give you different type of information, usually complementary, but it can even be <coughs> contradictory, okay? So it's, it's complicated. What to do with all these features that you can obtain? There is software that can give you automatically yeah, 7,700 features. So what do you do with all this? Then there is this part that is data science that you have to select the features and then use them, no? Typically for classifying or for forecasting. So I will finish here the presentation of this part and we start next class with the, time, the methods of time series analysis. And I want to finish with some exercise for you this afternoon to warm up. So basically, this is the exercise you should be able to do or try to do, see if it's how easy or how difficult it becomes. But there are some tricks, okay? There are some tricks. First, estimate this coefficient. Even with a very good computer, you will see that it's not that easy, okay? Basically, because when you approach a bifurcation, which are the points that you want for computing this coefficient, the dynamics becomes increasingly slow. It's a phenomenon that is called critical slowing down. So basically, you need to really increase a lot your transient, all right? But that's only near the bifurcations. If you try to do all this bifurcation diagram, taking a very, very long transient in all these points, it's gonna take a long time. So think about it. It's not, don't think it's like um, that trivial. It is, of course, doable, but so first begin with the bifurcation diagram. Think about how can you do to really estimate this. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge, but 
there are other exercises for the afternoon, so you can do this or do something else. And also, maybe you can think about that in reality, the parameter is continuously changing. No? So we can play and take a parameter, no? keep it constant, disregard the transient, and then plot the points, as I show you in the example. But in real life, the, the, the parameter is really constant, it's drifting. We have some drifting parameters. A lot of people talk about this in the climate, no? We have the increase of the CO2 that is drifting some changes in the climate. And this CO2, it does not stop for you to record the data and then it continues moving, right? So think about what, what do you get if you change your parameter in a continuous way? How, how things depend on the speed of the change of the parameter, okay? So that's it. And am I doing the time? Okay.